Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the first debate of the campaign season featuring all, all four gubernatorial candidates. And thank you all for coming. I'm Greg Torres, president of Mass Inc. and publisher of Commonwealth Magazine. Now before we begin, I'd like to thank Suffolk University for hosting this event here at the C. Walsh Theater and for their ongoing partnership with Mass Inc. and Commonwealth. I'd also like to thank the Barr Foundation for sponsoring this event, as well as our other sponsors and Citizen Circle members here today. And I'd like to thank the candidates themselves for donating this August afternoon to an in-depth single-issue debate on Cape Wind and its implications for energy policy, economic development, and the environment. Massachusetts is an incubator of sorts for the nation's most pressing public policy issues. From healthcare to public education reform, the state has served as a lab for experimentation that often helps shape our national policy. Cape Wind is no different. The nation is eager to reduce its reliance on fossil fuels and transition to homegrown clean energy but there are trade-offs involved in accomplishing this task. Cape Wind, in the works for nine years, would be the nation's first offshore wind farm. But that clean energy comes at significant environmental and financial cost. The turbines would be located in Nantucket Sound, one of the state's most treasured national settings. National Grid, the utility seeking state approval to buy half of Cape Wind's power, estimates its customers who already pay some of the highest rates in the nation would pay a hefty premium for the green electricity. Some say Cape Wind will help spawn a thriving green industry in Massachusetts and create new jobs. Others say its high power costs will make existing businesses less competitive and result in a loss of jobs. In summary, Cape Wind is really a debate about energy, the environment, and the economy with local, regional, and national implications. At Mass Inc., through our magazine, our research, and events like this, we encourage in-depth exploration of complex issues so that the public and policymakers can reach a better understanding of what is at stake. We believe strongly that enhanced public discourse leads to better public policy. Our magazine, Commonwealth Magazine, recently devoted an entire issue to energy and environmental issues facing the state. This debate takes a similar approach. Instead of moving quickly from one subject to the next, the candidates this afternoon will focus their attention solely on Cape Wind and the broader energy and environmental issues it has come to symbolize. We hope it will be both stimulating and enlightening. Before we begin, a few ground rules. I ask you in the audience to hold your applause so that we can make maximum use of the hour ahead. The candidates are aware of the format and ground rules so the only time you'll hear from me on that score is around timing, if speakers are veering off topic, or if I feel that, that there's an equal time issue that requires a slight course correction. The first round of the program will begin with each candidate giving a two minute summary of where they stand on Cape Wind and why, after which during round two, our reporters, Bruce Mole, the editor of Commonwealth Magazine, and Sasha Pfeiffer, the health and science reporter at WBUR, will ask questions of the candidates. During the third round, the candidates will then ask questions of each other. And finally, for round four, we will turn to closing statements. We will now start round one with the candidates speaking in alphabetical order. Our first candidate to speak will be Charlie Baker, the Republican candidate for governor. Mr. Baker, two minutes, where you stand and why. Thank you very much, Greg. And Thank you, Bruce, and thanks to the folks from Mass Inc. and Commonwealth Magazine for sponsoring this, and thanks as well to all of you for coming out on a hot August day to, to hear what we all have to say. Um, let me just start by saying that we, we live in unprecedented times in Massachusetts. There are 300,000 people out of work, 100,000 have lost their jobs over the course of the past four years, and you look at any of the data, the confidence, consumer confidence index, job generation, all of the data, and it indicates a very long and slow and painful process uh, for Massachusetts to get back on its feet and for all those people who are out of work to get back to work. When you're a state that has the fourth highest electricity costs, and in many cases usually lands somewhere between 40th and 47th on most surveys with regard to the cost of doing business, 
And as I travel around the state and talk to business after business after business about the high cost of doing business in Massachusetts, I can't possibly on an issue like this come down on the side of going forward. There are three reasons why Cape Wind is not a good idea. The first is no financial harm. That should be rule number one with regard to electricity part policy at this point in time in Massachusetts. Number two, we need to be transparent about the cost of a lot of our green initiatives, which we currently are not, and they ought to be put through the same competitive process that most other programs and policies have to go through to justify their value and their worth. And the third is, I'm all for diversification when it comes to diversifying our energy mix and our electricity mix. Cape Wind is not a diversification strategy, it's a big bet strategy. Now with respect to the cost, $600 million in state and federal tax credits to make this thing work from a construction point of view, that's right in the agreement. $800 million in ratepayer subsidies to buy 50% of the power. If you add the other 50% in, it's going to get a lot bigger. With regard to competition and transparency, no one really will know what the true cost of Cape Wind is to them as a business or as a resident here in Massachusetts because of the way the current system is set up. And as far as the diversification strategy is concerned, there are lots of options out there. I hope we talk about many of them today, most of which are cheaper than Cape Wind. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Our next speaker is Treasurer Tim Cahill, the independent candidate for governor. Treasurer Cahill. Thank you, and thank you to Mass Inc., Suffolk University, Greg, yourself, uh, Sasha, and uh, Bruce, and the great work that Mass Inc. has done. Uh, my feeling is that the Cape Wind project is a perfect example of the wrong approach to renewable energy investment. Uh, Cape Wind is set to cost more than $2 billion to construct and 6 to $7 billion um, in overall costs. Uh, it's $5 billion above wholesale market price, um, and the cost to ratepayers and taxpayers across the state is enormous, uh, given the already high costs uh, of electricity here in the state of Massachusetts. The negotiated contract that set the price uh, here in Massachusetts at 18.7 cents, and the thing that struck me is there's a guaranteed uh, increase of 3.5% per year. Not many private businesses get a guarantee from state government or from a major utility for price controls and price increases. And I think that is on the wrong, in, going in the wrong direction. Um, and it's going to make our state less competitive. The reason we're, we have high unemployment in the state, in addition to the national and the global recession, is because our state is not competitive. We have among the highest tax rates, highest cost per, per employee, um, and as Charlie said, one of the highest electricity rates in the entire country. And Cape Wind is only going to add to that. Um, it is uh, unconscionable that we're going to spend more on this offshore wind farm than others in other parts of the country and other countries spend on offshore wind themselves. And onshore wind would have been a much cheaper, much more efficient way to deliver energy and renewable energy here to Massachusetts. The subsidies are uh, not going back to Massachusetts um, companies, only 11 percent of the subsidies make their way back to Massachusetts, which means the other 89 percent go to other states and other countries. So clearly this is not the right path to bring energy independence to this state. We should look at the alternatives such as nuclear and natural gas and others to supplement that process. And I look forward to the debate today on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Our next speaker is Governor Deval Patrick, the Democratic candidate for governor, Governor Patrick. Greg, thank you, and to Mass Inc., and to the panelists, and everybody for coming out today. Thank you for the forum, and also to my fellow candidates. Thank you all for participating. I have, uh, from the outset, acknowledged that there are thoughtful views on both sides of the Cape Wind question. On balance, uh, I am in favor of Cape Wind, and strongly so. I think it's good for us uh, from an environmental point of view, from an energy point of view, from an economic point of view, and from a symbolic point of view. I think it's good for us from an environmental point of view because it's emissions-free generation, uh, generation of power, and we need to get serious about uh, climate change and not just talking about it and wringing our hands about it, but taking some steps that are tangible to address that. I think it's good from an energy point of view because offshore wind, wave, and tidal are our biggest opportunities for locally generated uh, clean energy. Uh, and we need to start uh, wisely exploiting them. And in the case of uh, price, uh, the negotiated contract, if I understand it, will add about a buck and a quarter uh, to our monthly ratepayer uh, bills. That compares to $20 more a month just uh, a year or 18 months ago when we were um, and would be more uh, subject to the volatility of uh, 
uh, global natural gas markets. I think it's good economically because of the 600 to 1,000 jobs that would be generated in this project alone. I think we get first mover advantage from having the very first offshore wind farm in America. Uh, we've already seen Siemens move their wind energy uh, facilities to uh, an office here to, to Boston. The wind blade testing facility is under construction now in Charlestown, and uh, we look for reliability in rates through a long-term uh, power contract. And I think it's an important symbol for us to be a leader among the eastern seaboard states that would really die to be where we are right now, this far along on a serious project of this kind, and to be a hub for a brand new American-based industry. So for all those reasons, I think on balance, Cape Wind is good for us. Thank you, Governor. Our next speaker is Dr. Jill Stein, the Green Rainbow candidate for governor. Dr. Stein. Thank you, Greg, and thanks again to Mass Inc. and Suffolk and uh, Greg uh, and uh, Bruce and, and Sasha. And I'm here uh, as a physician and a scientist, a long-standing environmental activist, and a mother who believes very much that the transition to the green renewable energy and a secure green economy is the task of our generation. And we need look no further than the fires in Russia, which are raising the price of food in this country, and the floods in Pakistan, which are certainly increasing our security risks, even here, to know that uh, we are paying a very uh, dear price for uh, the continued use and expansion of fossil fuels. But to succeed in this transition, we need to get the most green energy from each dollar that we invest, because those dollars are scarce. The most cost-effective investments, as we know, are continue to be conservation and energy efficiency. And after that, we need to pursue renewable energy in a cost-effective manner. And as Cape Wind comes to us today, it's clearly not delivering the most green energy for every dollar invested. And it's asking for an enormous investment, probably two and a half billion dollars, that will mostly come from ratepayers. So we can't blame the people of Massachusetts for questioning an incredibly expensive contract crafted behind closed doors while the governor, with all due respect, is pocketing a steady stream of campaign contributions from business interests that have an influence, that have a stake in the outcome. And I would not single out the governor here because I think this is true of uh, Beacon Hill politics as usual. It's true of the attorney general as well. But I know, having looked at the governor's uh, contributions, uh, over the last couple of days on this, that the numbers are high, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. So I think the people of Massachusetts have a right to ask for a transparent contract, open books, and assurance that the profits of Cape Wind and National Grid do not exceed a reasonable agreed on threshold. And to restore confidence, I'd ask that the governor and attorney general return the tens of thousands of dollars of campaign contributions that they've received from the utility companies in Cape Wind and, and their business associates. Uh, and that we begin to invest significantly in the proven capabilities of our municipal utilities that are Ten delivering seconds, public Stein. wind for as little as seven cents per kilowatt hour already. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stein. We'll now move uh, into round two of the debate. Here, uh, one of the reporters will ask a question of one of the candidates who will have two minutes to respond. The reporter can then choose to ask a follow-up question or will open it for comments by other candidates for a total of three additional minutes. The candidate who took the original question then has one minute for a final comment. Sasha Pfeiffer, let's start with your question. Thanks, and Treasurer Cahill, first question for you. And, and correct me if I mischaracterize your summary of Cape Wind, but, but basically your opposition to Cape Wind largely centers on, as you say, it will do financial harm. It will yes. require enormous tax credits, enormous correct. subsidies, will increase the cost of electricity. People like the governor see Cape Wind as part of a broader strategy to grow the green technology sector. And they want to do that even if it will provide, it will create power that's more costly than existing power, and even if that power will initially will need subsidies. So I, I want to gauge how much are you willing to subsidize? Can you talk where the line is? Do we need some subsidies, and where do we draw the line and tilt to what you think is too much? Well, I, I, I differ with the, from the governor and from the current administration in terms of their, their uh, commitment to picking winners and losers, whether it's in energy businesses or in other businesses, specific companies or industries. I think that's best left to the market. I think the market can decide, and the market usually will weed out uh, the successful um, strategies and the su successful 
uh, types of energy that we need here in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I don't think we're in a position to give out too many subsidies at all, given our economic straits that we're in right now, and given our budgetary constraints. So I, I would limit uh, those. Uh, I would stay away from government trying to pick and, and wanting so bad for certain industries to succeed that they over-subsidize. I believe this Cape Wind project uh, and other renewable energy product projects are going to um, cost so much money, especially if national ga natural gas continues to come down, especially as new technologies are found to get natural gas out of rocks uh, in different parts of the country. I mean, it, it appears that we may have 100 years worth of energy in natural gas. Um, which would mean the price would come down even more. Uh, nuclear, I believe, is a cheaper and now safer alternative than it used to be. We have a nuclear power plant here in Massachusetts that's now in its fourth year waiting to get renewed license renewal. That license renewal is up in 2012. The governor's office has done nothing uh, to try to help that process. In fact, they've tried to slow that process down. So I don't think we need to subsidize. Uh, I think we have to get out of the subsidy and the tax credit business, uh, lower taxes across the board, and let the private sector pick the winners and losers rather than government. Would you say subsidize not at all? Um, very, very little. I, I wouldn't, you know, I as far as taking subsidies away from already startup businesses and, and ones that are already invested, I wouldn't pull the plug on those, but we wouldn't add subsidies going forward. Governor Patrick, do you want to address that, particularly the idea that Cape Wind is so heavily subsidized that it's actually doing financial harm? Well, a couple things. First of all, the, um, the uh, renewable energy incentive has been in place for wind and any alternative project uh, uh, since um, 1997, the Utility Reconstruction uh, Act. And um, uh, about a third of Cape Wind is those so-called subsidies or, or incentives. So you take that away and Cape Wind is about within the range of what energy costs have been here in the last five years. Um, the cost to ratepayers obviously is what matters the most. That's the DPU's job um, to, uh, to do that evaluation. The National Grid contract helps in terms of stabilizing those rates over a decade or, or, uh, or more. Uh, the original negotiated price was at the low end of the range for, uh, in the world market for, uh, uh, for wind energy, and it's even better after the AG's uh, set, uh, settlement. So as I said at the outset, um, you compare that buck and a quarter a month to uh, twenty dollars more a month that we were paying just uh, just a year or eighteen months ago um, because of the volatility volatility of the of the world natural gas market and I think I am the only one up here who's actually worked in that field and I can tell you that the uh, um, and you all know from what you read in the in the newspapers the sources of natural gas and oil are, are some of the most volatile regions in the world and we're going to be dealing with um, uh, the impact of that volatility if we don't take some steps right now to break our dependence on, uh, on fossil fuel. Can I, can I hop in on that, just on one point there? Sure. Over the course of the past 10 years, the wholesale cost of uh, electricity among the current mix that Massachusetts uses for most of its electricity has never gotten above 11 cents, okay? 10 years, never been above 11 cents. May be volatile, but not so volatile as it gets anywhere near the fixed price 18.7 plus 3.5 percent that we're talking about here for Cape Wind. This will be by far the only people for whom this is going to provide reliability are going to be the investors who invested in Cape Wind, uh, and it's going to be an above market uh, uh, price for them over the length of this period of time. I cannot imagine a scenario where we're going to see natural gas prices, given some of the comments Tim made, uh, get anywhere near 18.7 cents. Uh, at the wholesale level, much less nuclear or coal and the other stuff that makes up most of our portfolio. And, uh, and most importantly of all, and Jill mentioned this in her comments, there's no transparency on any of this stuff. You're talking about a billion dollars in ratepayer subsidies and taxpayer money, and no one has any idea what the profit margin is for Cape Wind, what their financials look like. Um, key questions that I think absolutely positively ought to be addressed by somebody at some point in time, and as Bruce pointed out in his article in Commonwealth Magazine, um, there's just this big blob called distribution costs, which lands on everybody's uh, electric bill, which includes hundreds of millions of dollars and perhaps billions of dollars, if you play this one out over time, that everybody's going to be paying in their electric bill without having any idea where it came from or what it was. And I think the lack of accountability on that is a big problem, especially when you're talking about 18.7 cents wholesale when no one's been above 11 for the past 10 years. 
Two, two uh, real quick points about subsidies. One is that we not, we're not sure that we're going to get that subsidy. And as I, if I understand the contract correctly, uh, we're stuck paying the full price if the subsidy doesn't come through. So You're talking uh, about the federal tax that's credit. That's right, the yeah. federal tax credit. That's right. So I'm glad that Charlie and I find points of agreement here. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you go all the way around, Jill. There's a lot of you know, that reminds me. That's right. And, and the other point about subsidies, you know, the elephant in the room here is that we are hugely subsidizing the cost of fossil fuels. Uh, the Today. cost of, Right today, now. exactly, right, right now. So uh, I don't think we want to inherently, you know, oppose subsidies. You know, ultimately we want full cost accounting and no subsidies. But that means removing the incredible subsidies, about three billion a year that we're paying for the military uh, to keep the pipelines open, and another three billion a year that we're paying uh, for the health impacts of the fossil fuel. Um, energy system. So there are big subsidies here on the other side that need to be removed. And the final point is just that we need a plan. You know, uh, I, I, I don't think that uh, principle here would say go forward or not go forward. The point is we need to go forward with transparency and integrity and have a game plan here, not simply be reactive to a good idea that a developer happened to propose 10 years ago. We need a plan that makes sense for Massachusetts. Dr. Stein, thanks. We're, um, we're going to try to keep to a tight clock, so Bruce Moll is going to have the next question. And that's questions for you, Dr. Stein. Um, most analysts say wind, solar, and other forms of renewables even over the next 10, 20, 30 years, are not going to account for the bulk of our energy consumption. They're just not going to grow that quickly, and, and our demand keeps going up. Many people, including President Obama, say we need to embrace nuclear power as a long-term solution to generating a larger portion of our electricity needs with power that produces little or no greenhouse gases. Do you think we need more nuclear power here in New England? I think, again, just look at the Soviet Union, at Russia right now, where the fires are actually threatening uh, um, both a nuclear power plant as well as the uh, nuclear fallout still remaining from Chernobyl. So I think it would be incredibly foolhardy now to charge headlong into another high-risk, extremely expensive, and extremely subsidized industry that happens to have a lot of clout for the reasons I was alluding to earlier, that uh, you know we, we've got a pay-to-play culture uh, on Capitol Hill as we do on Beacon Hill. So absolutely no, we don't want to go nuclear. Um, you know, and the problem of not growing, I think, is really a problem of leadership, and it's a problem of, uh, of public dialogue and uh, focusing what's really a crisis uh, into the opportunity that it should become, because we have a crisis both in our economy and a crisis in our environment, as well as a crisis in our health and our healthcare system. And the nice story here is that we can solve them convergently, because by creating jobs where they are most affordable, where we get the biggest bang for the buck, that is particularly in conservation and efficiency, which is where we can gain the most, far more than what we can gain in any real time frame from renewables. We need to up the ante uh, on the basics, on the ABCs of clean renewable energy. And in doing that, we're also putting people back to work, uh, probably by the hundreds of thousands in this state alone if we were doing it right. So we can put people back to work at the same time that we create that green energy transition, and importantly, we can build an infrastructure for health in our communities by way of not only cleaning up the air and getting to green energy, but also creating a healthy local food supply, which is also really good for our health and really good for our energy profile. So you put that all together, and that's a win-win, and that's the kind of out-of-the-box out thinking that we desperately need to bring to Beacon Hill and uh, get on our way to a healthy, secure, green future that really is within our reach. Thank you. Uh, Governor, where do you stand on nuclear power? Do you, there were some comments by the treasurer earlier. Could you characterize where you stand? I like everything about nuclear except the d disposal issues. Uh, and I don't think we have solved the uh, disposal uh, issue. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, if we do, then let's move. I think it would be very, very hard practically to site a nuclear facility in, uh, in Massachusetts uh, today. And I think that the concerns that have been shared by many about the, uh, uh, at least the risk of tritium uh, leaks at, uh, at the facilities here in New England uh, today have just raised people's anxiety level, and I think understandably uh, so. I'd like to agree with um, one thing that Jill said just then about energy efficiency. I do agree. I'm sorry, Bruce, if this is a field of the question, but um, I do agree that energy efficiency is our first fuel. 
Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've put in place now uh, efficiency uh, incentives to invest some $2 billion over the next three years, and we estimate generating $6 billion in savings to ratepayers around the, around the Commonwealth. That is a part of the strategy, should be a part of uh, the strategy, and no one alternative uh, is going to get us where we need to be. Treasurer Kale, can you weigh in on the nuclear issue? Yeah, no, I think it's it's an important part of uh, the backbone uh, of the net, of the grid, electric grid in New England. Uh, Massachusetts gets 10 percent of its energy from nuclear, um, and as I said before, the governor has slowed that process down and even asked the federal government to slow down Vermont's nuclear regulatory uh, commission reciting. Uh, and Vermont gets 74 percent of their energy from their nuclear power plant. So uh, I agree that it would be virtually impossible if we can't site 130 windmills in Massachusetts that we would ever site a nuclear power plant. But to keep the one running and to make sure that the firm that owns that nuclear plant uh, is able to invest in that, that uh, contract runs out in 2012. They've been four years in the process. These processes usually take 18 months. Uh, I think they've addressed the issue of tritium um, and any kind of uh, waste from the facility. Um, and we absolutely have to have that as part of the New England backbone, and we have to participate in that. So I would be all in favor of renewing the license for Pilgrim and speeding that process up, because the bigger danger is if that license doesn't get renewed, uh, that the owners of that plant stop reinvesting um, in the technology and in the safety of that plant because they don't know whether they'll be there and whether it's worth another 20 or 40 years. So I think it's an important part. Uh, I agree with President Obama on this one case, that it should be part of our, our future. And it is a clean energy source. So. Mr. Baker, you have 30 seconds. Do you want to weigh in with any thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. With, I'm glad to see the President decide that this is part of the agenda. And I do believe it represents a piece of the solution here in, in New England and in Massachusetts. And I think the governors probably ought to be thinking about this one together. The one, the one other thing, I hate to be a broken record, but when the governor talks about investing $2 billion in energy efficiency, he's talking about $2 billion that we, collectively as ratepayers are investing in energy efficiency with no one actually knowing that they're investing two billion dollars in energy efficiency on their bills. You know, we have, remember folks, we are a very expensive state to do business in. We have 300,000 people out of work and a lot of these decisions will make in the short term and maybe even the long term our problems economically and competitively worse because there isn't the kind of transparency on this stuff that there should be. Bruce, may I just before we uh, go on, I wanted very to quickly. Uh, uh, very quickly respond to a point that the Treasurer has made twice about uh, alleging that uh, we've tried to slow down the uh, uh, approval process for, for Pilgrim. That's not the case. What we have done uh, is convey our concerns about uh, uh, tritium, elevated levels of tritium in test wells around those uh, facilities. That's a public health issue. That's the job. So I've been doing the job. I think the other point I would make uh, in response to Charlie's uh, uh, comment, first of all, he's right about the importance, if I may say, about uh, the importance of greater transparency around what we all play, pay, what we all contribute uh, around uh, uh, renewable, uh, uh, renewable um, subsidies and, uh, and credits through our, through our bills. Um, but it is also uh, true that we better get past all of the fighting and fussing we do about process and get on with some results. And as a result of what we have chosen uh, to do around energy efficiency, we will leave California behind, which used to be the le leader, in per capita investment in energy efficiency. It's another leadership opportunity for the, for the Commonwealth that we have seized, and I'm proud of it. Question for Mr. Baker. And I, I want to gauge your sense of urgency about the state's need to embrace green energy. Some of your opponents say we have to move more aggressively because the planet is running out of time, period. Others say we can move more slowly and deliberately because of recent breakthroughs in, in, uh, in, in, in recovering relatively clean natural, natural gas. Natural gas, 100 years, yeah. Exactly, and I'm thinking about Treasurer Cahill's reference to extracting yep. natural gas from shell rock formations. So can you talk about where you come down on that? How aggressively do we need to move, and, and how much time do we have? Well, I'm back to where I started, which is I have three principles on this. You know, Do no harm financially. I think Cape Wind does a lot of harm financially. Uh, diversify. I think diversification is a good thing, and I'm surprised we've, we're this far into this debate without anybody talking about Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec is clean, renewable, safe, proven, cheap. The state of Vermont just signed a contract with them for six cents per kilowatt hour. The state of Maine is about to do the same. They're willing to build and pay for the transmission line associated with that expansion. I don't know why we're not jumping on board with that one and pursuing it as hard and as aggressively as we possibly can. And the third is transparent and competitive. I was thrilled when the state put out their RFP 
uh, through National Grid and NSTAR to get a whole bunch of bids from locally based organizations, which the folks in Maine got grumpy about because of uh, <laughs> Kippy Mountain. Um, and and I, I think you did the right thing on that one, Governor. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities here for us to chase, lots of opportunities that fall into and meet those criteria. Do no financial harm, diversify our portfolio, and, uh, and are openly and competitively procured and transparent. Um, and I think we should move post haste on that because at the end of the day, that's important. But the other thing we should remember is, is Massachusetts and New England generally have done a pretty good job over the course of the past 10 years or so in getting to the point where the vast majority of our energy is provided by the most clean burning fossil fuel there is, which is natural gas. I think, I think, I think 1% or less than 1% of our electricity is currently be provided by oil. That's a pretty good record. Governor Patrick, could we be moving too aggressively on a project like Cape Wind, given hydro Quebec, given well, Shale it's, Rock? Well, it's amazing that only in Massachusetts can we say that a project that has taken 10 years to get from concept to final <laughs> approval is hasty. Um, it's been through 17 Touché. different legislative, uh, <laughs> seven, 17 different legislative uh, uh, or, or uh, agency reviews. It's had thousands and thousands of, uh, of pages of uh, documents submitted and, and uh, reviewed and re-reviewed. Um, look, it's not the solution. We are getting today three times as much renewable energy from Hydro Quebec as we get from from uh, Cape Wind at its height. And I'm open to more. We've been working with, uh, with Hydro-Quebec trying to uh, develop a new transmission line down through uh, New Hampshire. I don't agree, uh, Charlie, uh, with due respect on the notion that we should just change the, the um, uh, protocols about who pays for that transmission line. I think um, uh, the pro protocols in, f in place are right uh, and appropriate. But sometimes I think we confuse what counts as renewable with what we choose to subsidize. Um, Hydro-Quebec and Hydro generally, large and small, ought to count uh, and should count, I think, and would as a matter of uh, common sense, as a renewable source. But we choose to subsidize only new value-added uh, technologies, and that's been true since utility reconstruction, uh, 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 restructuring back when uh, Charlie was in, uh, uh, in office, and it's just like just about every other uh, state. So I think we should be moving on multiple fronts. I think wind is part of it. Solar is another. We have, uh, we have increased solar generation 20-fold in this administration, quadrupled the number of solar uh, installation and manufacturing companies, nearly tripled the number of uh, people working in that field. Um, battery uh, uh, and storage uh, technology and, uh, um, and manufacturing is on the move here in the, uh, in the Commonwealth as, uh, as well. And to, uh, to Jill's point, energy efficiency uh, we've got lots of examples of that, and energy efficiency, I think, has to be uh, central to our, to our strategy. And all of it back to the point about global warming, that's not the only, climate change is real, in my view, um, and in the view, I think, of most scientists. But rather than argue about the science, let's, there are lots of other reasons to be motivated to be fast, um, and, uh, and they have to do with energy efficiency and our national uh, security, and also the reliability of rates that are paid by uh, homeowners and businesses alike. Governor, thank you. But, but should Massachusetts consumers and business people have to car carry that water all the way? I mean, we are six <coughs> highest electricity rates or fourth, depending on mine and Charlie's numbers. We have the 40, we're 48th in energy consumption per capita, 47th in emissions adjusted for economic output. I mean, we're carrying the rest of the country. Um, we've lowered our energy use uh, we've increased our energy use, but we've lowered and cleaned our air over the last 20 years because our economy has changed. Not because government has changed our economy, but because it has changed. It has gone from a more manufacturing economy to a more service-based economy. We're using more electricity, but we're much cleaner. And I don't believe that we can keep up this pace without putting more people out of work. More businesses will continue to struggle. The governor likes to talk, and, and I hear this often when it comes to tax, it's only $1.25 or $1.30 a month on top of an already high electric bill. It's like when we raise taxes and they say it's only a cup of coffee. That's on top of many cups of coffee. That's on top of enormously high tax rates. And we can't afford to do the rest of the country's work. We're a very, very small state. We are not gonna solve, solve global warming ourselves, but we're gonna put our state at a tremendous disadvantage if we try to lead the way when we're not even the ones consuming. We're not even the ones that are creating or adding to the problem. 
Treasurer, thank you. If Can you could I, keep the comments about 30 okay, seconds. Just briefly, I, I, I want to just go on record challenging the presumption expressed uh, by the Treasurer, with all due respect, that there's a conflict here between what's good for the economy and what's good for the environment. And uh, you know, I think there is a win-win here by, by creating the green jobs. To look only at their impact on health, remember that one out of every two tax dollars now 14 billion out of last year's 28 billion dollar budget is spent on what we call health care but it's actually not health care it's disease care and we know that most of those expenditures are for diseases that can be prevented by reintegrating the infrastructure for health in our communities prevent them through uh, active transportation uh, and reclaiming an active lifestyle in our communities through healthy food which is part of the green economy and through uh, clean energy uh, and creating those green jobs uh, to, to bring us there. So there is a win-win here. Uh, and part of that win-win comes back in the lowered health costs as we begin to create an infrastructure through the green economy for health in our communities. Dr. Stein, thank you. Okay, I have a question for the governor. Yeah. Governor Patrick, um, much, many of the policies we've focused on here relate to Cape Wind and electricity consumption. And, and electricity usage is the greatest source of greenhouse gas emissions. But what about transportation, the second largest source? Are you in favor of using taxes and or regulatory policies to get people out of gas guzzling cars and into more fuel efficient vehicles or onto mass transit? Maybe, um, and let me, <laughs> let me tell you why I'm hedging. Um, I don't think that um, government policy alone, Bruce, is going to change uh, the behaviors as significantly as they need to be uh, changed. I do think that um, uh, the kinds of um, uh, purchase credits that are available for hybrid vehicles, that sort of thing, um, some of those um, uh, ideas around uh, uh, taxes and fees may help. But you know, you can say all day long to somebody in central Massachusetts they ought to get out of their car and get on public transportation, but if there's no train, what conversation are you having? So there's still um, a question that I think we have to grapple with in the, in the Commonwealth about how we start to reinvest again in our transportation, our, our public transportation infrastructure as an alternative. And where that is impractical in the, uh, uh, in the short run, then we gotta be thinking about other uh, alternatives to encourage people to change their behavior. I don't think it's all about government policy, but I think there are some leadership opportunities that we can use. Gas tax, anything like that, would you? Well, I, you know, I proposed the, uh, the gas tax, it went down in flames. Uh, and uh, and I, I proposed it not because anybody is, you know, nobody runs for office to raise taxes. But the beauty of the gas tax in the Commonwealth is that you can't use it for something other than transportation. So uh, under our con Constitution, you know, somebody can't come along with a better idea and say, well, you know, I'd like to move the money uh, over here. And we have starved our infrastructure, including uh, public transportation, for a long, long time, having largely to do with the big dig and the financing uh, uh, scheme that was put in, in place and how it has drained resources from all kinds of other, uh, other needs. I think that's a mistake, and we need to turn that, uh, turn that around. You know, the, the whole conversation about the, uh, about the sales tax increase was generated by the, uh, by the initial conversation about the, uh, uh, about the gas tax. We didn't have the political juice to get the gas tax uh, uh, the gas tax done, and I think um, having done the sales tax, we can't turn around and do a gas tax, not right now, not on top of that. Dr. Stein, how about you? Do you see any policies that we could pursue to get people out of the car, the gas guzzling cars and what have you? Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, there are just examples all over the place of where you provide people uh, the opportunities to get out of their car and to ride their bikes and to walk safely and to walk their kids to school, for example. Uh, and you need it to dovetail with public transportation that people are chomping at the bit to do that. Um, and it, uh, you know, it, it complements a policy of cleaning up our air so that you, uh, you, know, you go out there and you're not huffing and puffing in the incredible pollution. So I think these two things uh, complement each other and this will require an investment, but it's an investment that we need to make. Um, we're looking, for example, at Somerville where they're beginning to walk their kids to school and it's become uh, a citywide policy and there are all kinds of incentives to help people do it and they're seeing these kids actually losing weight and they're combating the obesity problem that we're paying a huge price for. So I think when we begin to do the full cost accounting, 
we can see that these investments are actually worthwhile and they pay back enormously, again, addressing that elephant in the room, which is one out of every two tax dollars that we're spending on diseases which are largely preventable. I, I drive a gas guzzling vehicle, so I probably wouldn't be the right person to uh, tell other people not to. Uh, I drive a Jeep. Uh, I don't think government should be telling people what cars to drive. Obviously, incentives. It, it, the fact that gas is a volatile uh, and price sensitive, I think, will determine whether or not people move to uh, smaller vehicles, more efficient vehicles. But I think the option should be left for people who choose to pay uh, and want a bigger car, uh, which I do. Um, and need uh, to be able to do that. Um, I will argue a little bit with the governor's comment about starving uh, public transportation. Um, we have uh, diverted a lot of money from the private roads and bridges here in the state over the last few years, and money hasn't been spent. We're seeing that impact. Um, but our mass transportation system has gotten a lot of money. Unfortunately, most of it's borrowed. Uh, we have the most indebted transit uh, system in the country, and a lot of that money is borrowed. A lot of money's been spent um, and we're spending too much, I believe, right now on expanding that network and that railway without focusing on trying to fix uh, the condition of the actual tracks and the actual service today. Unless we provide good service at the MBTA and our public transportation, people aren't going to choose. They're going to choose to drive their cars, no matter how long and how long it takes and how bad the traffic is. So we have to really focus on fixing what we have before we start expanding those rails out farther and farther and farther because we just simply can't afford it. Can I just, Very just oh. well, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Charlie. I was just going to say, the, 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 the thing we've done over the past few years that's taken people out of their gas guzzling cars is we lost 100,000 jobs by raising taxes in the middle of a recession and not taking seriously the fact that a job is a job is a job, and that's the most important thing we should be worrying about as a state. And I think the, the biggest problem we face as a state going forward is what are we going to do to get those people who are out of work back to work? That needs to be our fundamental objective. And I think this other stuff, you know, if we can do stuff in the energy space and the electricity space to diversify and not raise prices and all the rest, I'm all for it. But fundamentally, we need to be worrying about getting people who are out of work back to work, because that's what I hear every single day when I'm out there. I just Governor. want to respond to uh, um, first what the Treasurer said and then uh, what Charlie said, and I'll be brief. First of all, um, I think the spend in public transportation on fixing up and maintaining what we have as opposed to expansion is something like four to one. So. Uh, the, uh, the focus of, uh, of our transportation investments have been in dealing with the extraordinary backlog of uh, deferred maintenance and, uh, and state of poor repair. I think it's also true that the focus uh, for any governor, whether it's me in the next four years or one of these good people uh, here, has to be on uh, growing jobs. And that is part of the point for why uh, clean and alternative energy has been central to our job growth strategy. That sector has been growing even during the downturn. And it's not just people with PhDs and high degrees. There are people also getting uh, work through uh, community organizations like ABCD uh, in semi-skilled uh, positions doing energy retrofits and, uh, and energy efficiency installations. So I see this very much as a, uh, as a job growth uh, strategy. It's a real potential for us. We have a sweet spot if we get it right and use the concentration of brain power and venture capital uh, here. And, uh, and I think it ought to be um, and has shown itself to be a successful part of a growth strategy. Can I, can I just pop one quick thing in, which is um, the, there's, a, there's a difference here between businesses that are growing because taxpayers and ratepayers are paying for them to grow and businesses that are growing just because they're good ideas. And when I look at somebody like Zipcar, which is a Massachusetts-based company located in Cambridge, that is a wonderful example of they don't get any public subsidies. They're not, you know, the, the, there's nothing going on there where they're getting money from some taxpayer or ratepayer or otherwise. People are choosing to buy that product because they think it's a good product. And the best part of all is it does take people off the road. But even Zipcar had to fight with the state for a year to get to the point where the state of Massachusetts was willing to think about a Zipcar as something other than a rental vehicle so it could go through a toll booth without having to pay a commercial plate toll to get through the toll. And, and, and I think in some ways, you know, we think we, we forget about the fact that there are good ideas out there all the time, and if we just got the basics right, um, we create jobs and economic opportunity without having to choose one industry over another and, and put real money, either public money or ratepayer money, on the table. I got to tell you, I think any business person would tell you that energy and energy costs is a basic, and uh, and that contributes to the high cost of doing business here. That. And if we get it right, 
if we get it right, it is good for homeowners and good for businesses, and it is and a growth opportunity for us in terms of jobs. And, and the big question is if. And government doesn't often get it right when it comes to picking and choosing the winners, and that's where we're in the situation we're in right now. It's the private sector's job and the investor community's job to pick the winners and the losers, make the investments, but not have government do it. If we're right, then we'll move forward. If we're wrong, we're going to be way behind the eight ball and at a more competitive disadvantage as we go forward. Thanks well, to again, all of you. We um, would like to move on with a series of super quick questions that we think we can move through very rapidly because they should take only 30 seconds, maybe 15 <laughs> seconds or less to answer.